Women are amazing. We can do anything. Well, except for being wrong and catching spiders, but that might just be me. But you already know how amazing women are. You don't need me to tell you that. But what I can tell you about are some of the incredible women who served during the Second World War. I'm Sammy Dobson, and this episode of Style Stories is here at Discovery Museum. And we're going to be taking a look at women's war service through the clothes that they wore. The Second World War broke out in September 1939 and by the end of that year 1.5 million men had been conscripted into British Armed Forces. That left a lot of roles for women to fill as well as, you know, keeping the house clean and tidy and raising all of the children. In December 1941 women were called into service. Now they could either choose to join industry, like working in a munitions factory, or they could join the services, which included the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the Women's Royal Naval Service, the Women's Land Army, and the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Over 640,000 women served in the forces, as well as those who drove ambulances, worked as nurses, and those who worked in enemy territory, in the European resistance with the Special Operations Executive. The first one we're going to look at is a Women's Royal Naval Service uniform. Now, rather than saying WRNS every time, they have the nickname the Wrens, which both sounds quite nice and is much easier to say. Women were originally recruited into shore-based roles to free up men to serve at sea. Some recruitment posters stated, join the Wrens and free a man for the fleet. But as the war raged on, the Wrens played a major part. By 1943, there were 74,000 wrens serving in the UK and overseas. Although a few served at sea, they operated small harbour launches and tugs closer to shore. They planned and organised naval operations, including the D-Day landings in 1944, where some wrens served as pilots, taking smaller ships across the Channel. And a lot of women were based at Bletchley Park, where they were skilled code breakers. So Katie, what can you tell us about the wren that wore this uniform? Do we know who it belonged to? So this is Dorothy's uniform and she was a third officer in the Fleet Air Arm and she trained as a radio mechanic and a telephonist but she seemed to work in radar, track and planes for most of the war. Very exciting. Do we know where she was based? She got this uniform at HMS Pembroke and trained at Mill Hill in London. So she was there for about three weeks where she would have spent a lot of time scrubbing the floors working quite long hours. No, don't tell us that she had to scrub floors in that skirt. Surely, like, I can't scrub floors and make that look demure in trousers. Did Dorothy have trousers? Yeah, so she had these trousers, which were known as tiddly trousers or bell trousers. Tiddly being Navy speak for smart or neat. I was neat. gonna say, I can't be Navy speak for small because that's some <laughs> big old bell bottoms there, isn't it? Yeah, so the bell shape at the bottom, a bit like a flare, um, and they were very flattering. They were very light. And I'm looking at these and thinking I would absolutely wear them. I'm still not convinced I would wear them to scrub a floor. What are they made of? So they're made of wool. They were very warm. Warm I can understand, but scrubbing a deck in something that's going to take on water at such a speed and not really let it go. Um, oh, I can't. I can't envisage myself doing that one. You can see that she's altered it obviously to fit, make yeah. it more comfortable. I mean, she's lost about four inches off the waist of those. Well, I like the fact that even on your hands and knees, scrubbing the poop deck, you've still got fashion in mind that you would fit it to the waist. Now, I can say, lovely jacket, brassy buttons, very nice. I'm drawn to this hat. What other elements of the, the outfit were there? So this would have been worn with a white shirt and silk tie, black silk tie. And the hat was a tricorn hat. It was very popular. Mm. And this was so popular that it was produced for civilians in different colours. It was designed by Edward Molyneux. So I can see why women might have been drawn to this one. I mean, I imagine there was a fair few women drawn to the uniform, ended up on a boat and just vomiting for months on end. But you know, they had the hat. <laughs> you took me sick into that. <laughs> I absolutely would have been one of the ones that joined for that hat. Magnificent. So the next one you're going to show us is the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the ATS. Now, already not as drawn to this one. Yes, yeah, so it was kind of seen as a bit more frumpy one and the hat wasn't as liked as the tricorn hat. Well, no, I mean, look at it. Khaki did lag behind blue a little bit, but in 1941, they did make a bid to increase recruitment 
by offering a service field cap, which was a bit smaller one to the side, but this was a private item that came in at, at an extra cost. The ATS had an unfair image problem. Viewed as less prestigious than the Wrens or WAFs, there was always an air of snobbery surrounding the army, with rumours circulating of loose morals and the wrong kind of women living and working alongside men. Forming in 1938 off the back of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, initially the only jobs available were cooks, clerks, orderlies, storekeepers or drivers. The ATS wasn't given full military status until 1941, which helped to put an end to name-calling, which included nasty nicknames like camp followers and the not-so-clever auxiliary tart service. Women were finally able to get on with war work and make a significant contribution, including in work like anti-aircraft, known as ACAC. As part of mixed-sex batteries, women took on radar, identifying enemy aircraft and controlling the direction of guns, although they weren't allowed to fire them. Eventually, there were over 100 different roles in the ATS and more than 250,000 women, making it the largest of the women's services, possibly helped by the service of the future Queen Elizabeth II and Mary Churchill, daughter of wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill. So, Katie, can you tell us more about this uniform? What bits was it made up of? So, you've got the cap, you've also got the jacket and the skirt. It came with a shirt. This uniform came with two ties, which you'd wear. It looked very smart. The belt as well, which would clip on with little poppers. And for manual work, they also got battle dress, which was a blouse and trousers. Um, I love the idea of donning a battle blouse. That's um... <laughs> That's really tickled me. So you've got this for, what would, what would you wear this for if that was for more manual stuff? So this is more service dress, um, you know, like going on parade right. or for inspection by your officers. It was kind of more representation of your role and then the battle dress to keep you, anything you were wearing underneath clean. Well, a battle blouse sounds brilliant and fierce, but it doesn't sound very warm. No, so during the winter months they get issued a great coat, which will keep them far warmer. What about summer? So for overseas work and in summer, there could have been issued a dress, which would have been made of much lighter sort of cotton material. I'm very excited about the idea of a little khaki dress. See, this is the sort of thing they're not thinking about. If you've not got a great hat, push the dress. That's, oh, that is, that does sound nice. So I do know about a lady who did have uh, this uniform, not this particular one. She was called Violet and she actually altered her uniform to make it look a little bit smarter. So she was a tailoress before the war and she got compliments from our sergeant for doing that when she was in line. You would think that she'd probably get in trouble for it, but she did such a good job that he was like, well, I have to applaud that, it looks magnificent. Well, no, they weren't allowed, but she did it anyway and she got compliments. Yes, Violet, brilliant. What I do like about this one is the fact it's belted. Where the Wrens one was quite straight up and down, this is belted so it does draw in the way, so I can see if you were a dab hand with that sort of thing, how you could just tweak this slightly to make it a little bit more appealing. Now, Katie, next up we've got a Women's Auxiliary Air Force uniform, a WAF uniform. This is sort of similar to the ATS one. It was quite a similar cut, but it came in the colour slate blue, which seemed a little bit more popular. And the other thing that was really popular about it was the fact that they got stockings, black stockings, which are very hard to come by with rations during the time. The Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the WAFs, were formed in June 1939, just before the outbreak of war. Under the administration of the RAF, a bit like the ATS, the only jobs for women in the early days were clerks, kitchen orderlies and drivers. Filling these roles allowed men to fight on the front line, but women soon became experts in telephony and telegraphy. They worked as mechanics, engineers, electricians and fitters for aeroplanes. They interpreted aerial photographs and gave weather reports, and they worked in radar as reporters and plotters. But the toughest job was working on the barrage balloon sites, lowering and raising huge balloons around 66 feet long and 30 feet high to deter enemy bombers. Women ran over a thousand sites across the country and they must have been knackered. So what can we tell from looking at this jacket? Because there's all sorts of different patches and badges. Does this tell us anything about the person who owned it? So this jacket was actually owned by Violet and her name's written in the back of her collar. So the badge with the propellers on would have meant that she was a leading aircraft woman, which is a junior position. And the chevrons and her sleeves, we've got one, 
which means one year of service. And then the other side, we've got five red chevrons, which would have meant five years of service. So in total, she did six years of service, which was the entirety of the war. And there's also an A on her shoulder next to the eagle, which would have meant that she joined around 1939, at the very start of the war, when the WAF was still being established. So she's had a really long, like six year career, which is really impressive. And the medal as well. So the, the little decoration above her pocket would have actually been a defence medal. So she could have been awarded this during the war or just afterwards. That's amazing. And all of that you can see told just in this one jacket. It's so nice to be able to know what all these things mean and sort of a bit more about who she was. Well, after seeing all those proper uniforms, I can't tell you how good it is to finally see some dungarees, something practical. <sighs> This, see, this, this is the one for me. Dungarees, pockets, I'm in. Now, obviously, this one had to be a little bit more practical and comfier because this is the Women's Land Army uniform, is that right? Yeah, so these are the dungarees that they were issued. They are also issued a shirt or a blouse, but you could wear your own, so this is quite a lenient uniform. It wasn't as strict as the other uniforms, so you could wear your own blouse, jumper, you can knit your own jumper. All right, so in between keeping the house, raising the children and toiling the land, you just had to knit yourself a jumper as well. You could also knit your own socks. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to. If, if someone's going to give me a pair of socks, they look wonderful. I, I think I could have only done myself a disservice by trying to wear my own. <laughs> These could be one with breeches as well, corduroy breeches, which would have been a bit warmer for winter months. Dungarees probably would have been better for hot summers and you could wear just a blouse underneath that keep you quite cool. And of course, working on farms, muddy, you could wear your own footwear. You're also issued brown service shoes, which look very nice, <laughs> but you wouldn't find yourself wearing them very often. So you could wear wellies, boots, anything that would be appropriate for the kind of work that they were doing. And of course, famous for the headscarf. Yes, so keeping your hair out of the way. If you're working on a tractor, you want it out your face. Yes, for safety as well. Yeah, definitely. So keep it up, jazz it up with a headscarf. So as much as I'm sure if you can successfully knit a jumper, you would have been a little bit warmer. Was there a coat, much like the, the great coat from before? Yeah, so you'd get issued a great coat. There's a story about a land girl called Charlotte and she got sent a letter asking her to return her uniform, but it did say that she was allowed to keep the coat, but she could have it dyed in navy if she wanted. And was that common? Was Charlotte an exception? Were they just letting her keep her coat or was that across the board? I'd never heard of it until I heard of Charlotte's story. So it was actually a letter from Marks and Spencers. And they turned around and they were like, can we have a uniform back? We'd like to recycle it. The Women's Land Army, or the WLA, were originally set up in 1917, but disbanded after the First World War. Having imported a lot of its food, in the lead up to the Second World War, Britain needed to become more self-sufficient by growing food at home and increasing land cultivation. Many men who were working in agriculture had joined the armed forces and women needed to step in to create a new rural workforce. Women were recruited from towns and cities and could be sent anywhere in the country to live and work on farms. The accommodation was basic and lonely, so as more women joined the WLA, hostels were set up and by 1944, 22,000 women were living in 700 hostels across the country. The work was hard. Women were responsible for land reclamation, which included using heavy machinery like tractors and excavators. About a quarter of land girls, as they were nicknamed, did dairy work, and a lot of that time was spent rat catching. It was estimated that there were over 50 million rats in Britain at the time, and someone had to keep them away from the food. Now, I'm trying to imagine myself doing all of these jobs and wearing all of these outfits. A lot of it doesn't feel particularly practical apart from this. It felt like how you looked and how you were turned out was really important because it was how other people saw you. How does hair and makeup fit into all of this? So hair was quite strict. You did have to have it tucked up to shoulder length, pulled out the way, wear a headscarf. That's why there's a lot of women working in factories, especially for safety. Some women in the services, the ATS, the RENs, the WAF, got offered hair sets, which they could have regularly. And this was to kind of keep up their appearance, keep the hair looking nice and smart and out of the way. For free? Mm-hmm, yeah, it was offered to them. Yeah, it's part of their service. 
And by set, you do mean sort of like a like a, a blow wave or something in a salon rather than it was a little bag of something that they used <laughs> at home? <laughs> no, so they would um, wash the hair and probably set it in rollers, uh, a bit like a perm. Say, I'm going back and forth between all these. Love the dungarees. Free blow wave, thank you very much. Ah, it's, it's hard to choose which one I'm going to elect to join at the end of this. So that's the hair. We've got nice free sets for women in uniform. Headscarf, if you're on the land. What about makeup? In the services, it was a bit of an opportunity to kind of go makeup free, but women were still encouraged to wear a bit of red lipstick. Um, there was a lot of lipsticks named after sort of war themed victory red, auxiliary red. Hitler hated red lipstick, so that was, of course, why it was encouraged. In your face, Hitler. I, every time I put red lipstick on now, that's what I'm going to remember that this is. <laughs> oh, Hitler would have hated this. That's marvellous. The now famous 1941 blonde bombshell image created by Abram Games, which showed a blonde woman with bright red lipstick wearing the new ATS cap with the statement, join the ATS, caused controversy. Jean Knox, the new director of the ATS, claimed it looked like a lipstick advert. The media's concern over women in the services had dragged on throughout the war. Women were too glamorous and then they were too masculine, Polls in outlets such as the Daily Mail stated that the worst thing about the war was women in uniform. Never mind all of the suffering, loss of human life and devastation of cities, towns and villages, a woman's independence was truly a thing to fear. I mean, it must have been a great relief to the media when war finally ended. Although, what would they have to write about then? But for the incredible brave women who risked their lives to serve this country, who'd learned so much, who'd gained independence, confidence, made new friends, who'd suffered terrible lows but experienced great highs and who'd been paid two thirds less than men, all unarmed, because I wouldn't give a loaded gun to a woman who was being underpaid either. It was all up. The men returned and the women were demobilized. They went back to their normal lives, domesticity. Some served in reduced forces and some got jobs, but most got married and had kids and their efforts were airbrushed out of history. But it wasn't just a man's war. Women played a huge part in the war. Over a thousand lost their lives. And it's only in recent years that what they did has really been taken into consideration and how badly treated they were acknowledged. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Style Stories. Look out for more, where we'll be telling the story of women through the ages, through the clothes that they wore. If you've enjoyed this, like, subscribe and share with your friends, but not the enemy.